Coming live from our studios in Belize City, this is the evening news on Love Television for Monday, August 8th. We get you started with a look at the stories making the headlines today. Residents of low-lying areas urged to remain alert for floods. Recovery efforts continue as we look back at Hurricane Earl. Belize Progressive Party issues a statement on hurricane relief. Kamalote Villager, the victim of weekend murder in Belize City. Two men found guilty of burglary, sentenced to seven years in jail, and Belize and Guatemala to sign agreement on prisoner exchange program. The Belize rural area was severely affected by Hurricane Earl. Nemo Rural District Coordinator Kevin Pollard spoke with Love News about the assessment that is ongoing. Presently we are still doing assessment in the area. Um, we have done assessment in Western Paradise. We, have, we are still doing assessment in Hattieville. We got, we've done assessment in La Democracia. We'll be going to Grace Rock and uh, Rockville today. How the, um, does the damage look? Well, some of it are, is really surprising and devastating. The, the, when you see some of the homes that is flat on the ground, all you see is remnants of the roof. And some of them, when it hits the ground, it don't even look like someone lived there. But it's really, it's really terrible. We have an assessment team going around because it's not a free-for-all. We make sure that the people affected are getting the help that they need and whatever additional needs that they have that we don't have at presently we note it down and hopefully we can see what we can do. We Pollard spoke about the aid that they have been providing to those in need. He also spoke about the rebuilding efforts that will be taking place soon. What kind of um Aid has been provided at this point. Food packs, cleaning supplies, mattress, water. In Hattieville, we have done over 90 families. Um, in Democracia, we have done six families. And in West, West, Western Paradise, we have done about 20, 20, 25 families. At this moment, what do you see people needing the most? Mostly roof. Roof and a few people need siding and some would need a complete house. Nemo Rural Coordinators will be visiting Gracie Rock, Freetown Sabun, and Rockville this week. The rebuilding and recovery mode continues in Belize following the passage of Hurricane Earl. While unlike in other countries, Earl did not claim human life. It left behind a trail of destruction. Today we spoke with Belize City Councilor with responsibility for SEMO, Philip Willoughby, who urged those affected by the hurricane to bear with officials. I'd like for them to be patient and remain calm. I know that is asking a lot at this time, but in order for us to coordinate um, the damage assessment and need analysis teams on the ground, I would like for residents of Belize City Belize City proper, Belize City only, if they could kindly go into the Human Development Office on Regent Street, share their information with the officers, and that will help us to coordinate the, the, the damage assessment personnel on the ground. I know to this end I have been receiving numerous texts, numerous calls, and it, it would facilitate the process much easier and better if they can relay this information themselves directly to the Ministry of Human Development on Region 3. So to assist in the coordination of reaching those who have been affected as a result of Hurricane Earl. We also asked Councillor Willoughby about the ongoing cleanup on the streets. We are like at 99.9% .9 fully operational. We have a 17 hour man shift. We have trucks on the ground. We have our asset equipment, backhoes, um, front end loaders, um, in some cases, excavators. Um, we also have um, 
personnel from the forestry department, as we mentioned previously, um, coming in from the mountain pineage area, who are professional um, tree, tree, tree personnel. Um, we have BDF along with the teams also, along with the Billy City Council personnel. So that is going well. It's just a matter of coordinating all the resources and efforts, and we try to clean up and bring back the entire city to normal zone. And we've have, we have also employed temporary workers to assist in the initiative. Um, besides that, we have done at least 60%, I believe, of Southside Belize City. As we proceed to do so, we know that residents are putting back out um, garbage, um, debris, and so forth after we have done the initial cleanup. So I, am, I have suggested in several discussions we, we continue for about two more weeks. We then consider suspending the cleanup operation. Then we do a mass PR campaign to have everyone put out their waste and then we resume back the um, cleanup campaign. You know, so that, that's a task that we have in process and in motion at this time. If that is the case, then everyone will be notified. But it's a huge, relatively huge amount of waste we have to deal with at this time. Even at the transfer station, we had an issue in dealing with the amount of garbage. We had to bring in um, bulldozers to actually clear where the debris are going. Um, and that is silt. That is, you name the garbage and it is there. So what we have done, we have sectioned off the transfer station. Um, and those waste will be directed to serve different spots to be dumped. And then the bulldozers will spread these waste and continue pushing them to facilitate and allow the remaining waste to go up to the transfer station. Late Wednesday night, we saw the approach of Hurricane Earl to Belize City. We join Rene Trujillo for a recount of the storm. Hurricane Earl is one that residents in the Belize District will not forget anytime soon, as the damages and destruction it left in its wake was in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Families have been displaced as homes, appliances, and even the bare necessities were lost due to the heavy rains and strong winds. Wednesday evening in Belize City and in the rural areas saw residents doing their last-minute stocking up of supplies, while some were securing their windows and homes from what many thought would have been of little impact or significance. By 7 o'clock in the evening, the streets had become bare, with very little pedestrian or vehicular traffic. The eerie silence on the main thoroughfares around the city was perhaps symbolic of the danger that Earl brought with him as everyone sought refuge either in their homes, a relative's house, or a hurricane shelter. The approach of Earl saw the winds picking up between 8 and 9 o'clock as the thick raindrops began beating on the roofs and pavements, accumulating fast in the flood-prone streets. In the Lake Independence area, like every other substation around the old capital, the police station was opened and manned with Assistant Superintendent of Police Ernal Dominguez in charge of keeping an eye out for the thieves who come out at night even during natural disasters. We are monitoring the, the movements of people as well as monitor the areas where we believe that um, the residents might not be at home. So we are looking at the area of security in general as it relates to flooding and as it relates to homes and property. Assistant Commissioner of Police Chester Williams was prepared to command his area as the storm was looking to set in just over Belize City. We have um, our patrols up and running and um, we have beefed up our presence in the commercial as well as the gang ridden areas and uh, in the commercial areas basically to ensure the safety of shoppers as well as the safety of those persons, the business people. And in the gang ridden areas we still want to ensure that we keep an eye out in those areas to prevent any persons who may want to go and commit any crime. By 10.30 on Wednesday, August 3, 
Banners, zinc roofs, trees and park benches were being rattled by the winds accompanying Hurricane Earl. By this time, some had realized that their homes would not withstand the weather, and in the fierce winds they found their way to a shelter or a neighbor. For six hours straight, Earl battered the structures, destroyed crops, trees and parks, taking anything that would give in to its anger. By daylight, things had calmed down. And although the all clear had not been given by the National Emergency Management Organization, many came out of their homes to see what Hurricane Earl had left behind. Some homes escaped untouched by the storm, while others lost all they had, like Miss Marion Torres, who lost everything she owned. I know that I experienced um, hurricane before, in 1961 hurricane, as I told you. So uh, you, you, you insert with somebody, knock something, something one, you jump. I wish the public could have helped me, give me a helping hand, so that I could get back into my house. If they so desire by the, uh, the people now. I bring out a, a kit bag with um, some clothes in there and sheet, but the best part, my part of my clothes left in at the house. So with that, I run the bike, move and left the balance. The Vista Del Mar area was where the fair was for most of the hurricane, as the waters rushed into their homes, causing them to seek refuge in the ceilings of their home or atop their furniture. Rescue teams had attempted to go in and extract the families from their homes, but even the military commander had conceded that Earl was quite the contender. By mid-morning, the Prime Minister of Belize, Dean Barrow, addressed the citizens, expressing gratitude for Earl having bore no casualties. We have survived, even if barely, and I would want to begin by saying that as of um, 11.30, 12.30, when we concluded our internal meeting in preparation to come and talk to you this afternoon, no casualty, no loss of life was reported. God is good. Reporting for Love News, I am Renee Trujillo. The Altunha Archaeological Reserve is now open. Altunha now joins Kahalpech, Santa Rita, Seramaya, Nimli Punit, and Lubantum as the only sites open to the public. The National Institute of Culture and History says all other archaeological reserves and cave sites remain closed until further notice. The Belize Audubon Society has issued an update as it relates to the areas they co-manage. The Half Moon Key Blue Hole Natural Monument is open to the public while the Crooked Tree Wildlife Sanctuary is open. Some trails within the village are still inaccessible. St. Herman's Blue Hole Natural Monument will reopen on Tuesday. Only the Blue Hole and Lowland Trail to St. Herman's Cave will be open to visitors. All water activities are on standby until water has receded to a safe level. No tours will be allowed to visit Crystal Cave as the trail has yet to be cleared of debris. The Coxcomb Basin Wildlife Sanctuary and Guanacaste National Park remain closed. Tour guides, tour operators and visitors are asked to respect the closures as it is being done for safety purposes. The aftermath of Hurricane Earl has seen several agencies coming together to restore and rebuild after the strong winds and rain had destroyed structures, power lines and homes. The response from the National Emergency Management Organization, NEMO, was rapid and continuous as assessments continue to be conducted and works are ongoing in the provision of building supplies and care packages. Despite all these efforts, however, the Belize Progressive Party, BPP, referring to themselves as the government-in-waiting, has noted that they are ready to launch their 3R plan and ready to work with the government of Belize to ensure success in the aftermath of Hurricane Earl. The three R's are relief, recovery and rebuilding. According to the BPP, their plan is a three-pronged approach with its core elements being good governance, accountability, transparency and equity. The BPP is recommending that the areas most affected by Earl be declared disaster areas and that immediate relief be provided. 
Also under the relief portion of their plan, the BPP is proposing a tripartisan committee that would meet with international agencies to discuss aid. According to third party, Nima supply should be consolidated to supply food, shelter and clothing to most affected areas, while security forces be deployed to the affected parts, but especially to the offshore areas of Key Corker and San Pedro. The release by the BPP went on to recommend that a statutory instrument be passed to exempt taxes on fuel, construction supplies and materials for a period of 90 days in the first instance and that an SI also be passed to put all foreclosures on a two-year moratorium while passing usury laws to control interest rates. In the recovery aspect, the BPP has noted that the agricultural damages be assessed quickly so that farmers can get immediate assistance in order to expedite their recovery and that the National Bank of Belize makes money available to Belizean business owners at low interest rates. The rebuilding efforts, according to the BPP, should be done through the provision of housing, infrastructure and a stipend to support families that are in considerable need based on specified criteria. This past Saturday morning, a young man, Carl Trapp, was stabbed multiple times, causing his death. Police addressed Trapp's murder this morning, ruling out completely the idea of robbery, as they found a large amount of money on Trapp's person. Assistant Commissioner of Police Chester Williams, officer in charge of Eastern Division South, shared the details. On Saturday, April 6th, sometime after 6 a.m., Police were called to Hyde's supermarket, that is within the Finnegan market area, where upon arrival the lifeless body of one Carl Trapp was seen with what appeared to be multiple stab wounds to the face and back. He was transported to the KHMH where he was pronounced dead on arrival. ACP Williams stated that Trapp's family had just seen him alive after Hurricane Earl. Investigation, what we have learned is that the night of Friday, April 5th, he was visited by two persons in an SUV those persons we have gathered are his family members who came down from Kamalota to visit him to see how he was after the storm. After those persons left his home, we learned that he took off on a bicycle and he went somewhere and returned shortly thereafter and that was the last time he was seen alive. Police have interviewed several persons in respect to this investigation, but so far we have been unable to ascertain a motive or even a suspect. I must say that police search of the body, we found over $350 in cash, and his cell phone, so that automatically ruled out robbery as a possible motive. It could be seen as a crime of passion, and it could also be seen as a crime of hate. But like I said, we are still investigating. The investigation is still in its infantry stage. We are asking anyone who may have any useful information where this investigation is concerned to please feel free to contact us or to call the 0800-922-TIP number and leave the information there and then we will move forward from there. Police believe that Trapp was acquainted with the person who killed him. Dennis Jones and Wilson Gonzalez were sentenced to seven years in prison when they appeared in Belmopan Magistrates Court. The duo was charged with burglary. Last Friday, a resident of Banana Bank reported that his home was burglarized and over $14,000 worth of cash 
and electronics were stolen. Jones and Gonzalez were arrested and charged. There hasn't been any publicizing of it from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but Love News has learned from an online publication in Guatemala that Belize has signed on to an agreement surrounding the enforcement of prison sentences. The signed agreement reportedly has up to six articles of understanding and was drafted with the idea that both countries are to maintain and deepen friendly bilateral relations. The agreement is based on the rehabilitation of convicted criminals and provides for each country to have their respective citizens that are incarcerated across the border to return to their country and serve out their sentences in their country of origin. Article 3 of the document speaks of having penalties payable in the prisoner's country of origin if there is a fine or penalty attached. The document also notes that every prisoner must be made aware of this agreement between both countries and must at all times be updated on their status as it relates to the transfer process. The signed agreement is reportedly based on the framework for confidence building signed by both countries on September 7, 2005 in which one of the purposes is to maintain and deepen friendly bilateral relations until the territorial, insular and maritime dispute is resolved permanently. It is also based on the roadmap for strengthening bilateral relations signed in Washington, D.C., United States on January 24, 2014 by the two foreign ministers. The agreement is for a term of 10 years and has automatic renewal unless one of the parties through diplomatic notification decides to end it. In that case, the termination of the agreement will take place one year after submission of the diplomatic note. Welcome back to Love Television's Evening News. Nemo has released its latest advisory. It says immediate relief to the affected people and restoration of critical lifeline facilities continue as the country returns to normalcy, less those severely impacted. Nemo and the government providing assistance with help from the community. The utility companies' operations are progressing at a steady pace, enabling the country's recovery. A total of 170 persons remain in shelters in the Belize, Cayo, and Orange Walk districts. Nemo National Relief and Supplies Management Committee continues to mobilize reaching out to people in the affected communities with food, water, tarp plastic, sheeting, cleaning supplies, mattress, etc. BATSA, BDF, and UNICEF have been assisting people in the shelters. The Belize Red Cross and USAID are supporting NEMO with field operations. The Indian community in Belize provided lunch yesterday for the shelterees in Belize City. Billy White and Santa Familia Water System is still down. Emergency water relief is being organized for those in need. Crooked Tree, St. Anne, Santania, and Corosalito Water System have been restored back to normal. On the Old Northern Highway, a water truck will be providing water for those in need. San Pedro is currently experiencing low water pressure as VWSL continues to repair leaks in the system. BL continues work in Belize Rural. As it relates to the telecommunications companies for SpeedNet, the Renaissance Tower site is expected to be repaired by Sunday. Two towers near JB on George Price Highway is down and currently undergoing repairs. BTL customers in the following areas are experiencing little or no mobile voice or data service due to cell site outages, Lucky Strike and Boral Boom. The cell site of Love FM was completely destroyed, therefore surrounding neighborhoods may be affected. People in the Belize district along the Belize River must continue to monitor the river. An area of concern is Belize River Valley, Vaqueros and Privacion Bridge are impassable to heavy equipment and big trucks. Small vehicles must exercise extreme caution whilst driving in this area. Spanish Lookout via Baking Pot Ferry and Iguana Creek Bridge are impassable at this time. The access road through Bullet Tree Falls Village via the Bullet Tree Bridge is open. The wooden bridge in San Ignacio across the Macal River remains closed and is seriously damaged. The Hamak Bridge in Kala Creek has been destroyed. Blue Creek Road is open and passable to vehicular traffic. People living in those flood-prone areas are being strongly encouraged to seek safety and move to higher ground to protect life. Move out of areas that are likely to flood. Protect life first. Stay away from flood waters. Farmers with livestock take the necessary actions 
and seek safety and move them to higher grounds. Do not cross floodwaters, especially at night. Over the weekend, we told you of the direct flight to Belize that Southwest Airlines will be putting in their schedule from Denver. That is Colorado in the USA. Those flights, however, will not begin until March 2017, and they will be seasonal. Taking effect in October 2016 via WestJet, Airlines is in the inclusion of Belize into their travel route out of Canada. The inaugural flight will be on October 29, 2016, with plans for two flights per week. According to the Belize Tourism Board's director, Karen Bevans, it is exciting news that has come as a result of ongoing discussions with WestJet. Bevans added that with the high season coming up, the BTB is optimistic and pleased at the inclusion of Belize, and she has no doubt that it will boost our tourist arrivals numbers, particularly from the Canadian market. WestJet will depart Canada from the Toronto Pearson International Airport at 9.15 a.m. and arrive at the Philip S. W. Goldson International Airport at 11.59 a.m. It will depart Belize around 1 p.m. on Wednesdays and Saturdays. The addition by WestJet has garnered positive comments on social media with one man saying, quote, yes, keep them coming, better vacations at cheaper rates and minimal hassle. It is time to upgrade our airport. Another person wrote, quote, great news by passing U.S. immigration along TSA security lines, end of quote. As it relates to the direct flight on Southwest Airlines from Denver, Colorado in Belize, it was noted that the statistics showed that more than 13,000 passengers made the trip last year, reflecting an increase of 50 percent when compared to 2013. There are currently 500 persons registered with the Love Foundation over a course of two years. These parents and children are beneficiaries of the parenting, anger management, and other courses offered by the Love Foundation in an effort to end the cycle of crime, abuse, and poverty. The programs are geared at building self-esteem and confidence whilst install instilling positivity into their lives. Today, however, the Love Foundation has embarked on a different program as they are working at helping their members in rebuilding their lives after the majority of them were affected by Hurricane Earl. Deborah Sewell is the Executive Director for the Love Foundation. She spoke to us about the cause they are working towards for the next four weeks. As our programs are grant funded, there's a criteria um, you know, for participants, and the criteria is that they have to come from economically disadvantaged communities, they have to be at risk, um, some of them are gang involved, some of, so it, it varies, but they are all economically disadvantaged um, from those kinds of areas and children who are at risk. All of them have been impacted in some way or the other. Um, less than 100 um, have been severely impacted, meaning that they lost roofs from their homes or they lost part of their homes. Um, and you know, need to rebuild in some kind of way. Some of them are still with relatives or in, um, in, in shelters. The areas that we work in are the Port Loyola, Yabra area, um, St. Martin's area, Lake Eye, um, well, the Bailar community in the Mayflower um, neighborhood. Sewell says they are seeking the donation of clothing, school supplies, among other things that are greatly needed by those who are affected. Looking at getting the children into school at least within the first week. We know that a lot of the parents have um, already started buying um, school books and uniforms and things like that. Those were all destroyed. People had books inside of burials that got wet and those are all destroyed. Uniforms um, are gone. So we're really looking at, the, um, at getting them clothes, clothing for school, um, shoes and underwear, socks, that's a big thing, the socks, the underwear, those kinds of things, um, and looking at hopefully helping out with blankets and sheets and towels and things like that because they did lose their bedding. Most of them lost mattresses, sponges, um, things that they use for bedding. So we're looking at you know, trying to replace those kinds of things. We're very careful when people make monetary donations. We always want to make sure that, um, that we can account for those. So 
what happens is um, anybody who's donated anything, we have taken their names, their addresses or email addresses, um, and their phone numbers because we want to be able to um, let them know what, what um, their donations were used for. So we've had commitment of some funding that will help to buy zinc and plywood and nails and things like that. We're asking skilled people to come on board to help us. We don't have the, the funds to rebuild anybody's home and we're not promising to rebuild anybody's home, but we have indicated that where there's a need for a couple of sheets of plywood and a couple of sheets of zinc, that we will provide that. We have the commitment from people within the community who are willing to help to um, fix other people's home, but you know, to get it back to a place where they could move in, move back in um, and dry. So um, we're asking people if, you know, donations, monetary donations will go towards purchasing those kinds of things. Um, any donation of, um, of, of clothing will be sorted and people will be able to, to choose from the clothing that's donated. We're asking for used uniforms, if anybody has uniforms, um, you know, that, that would be a big help for a lot of these children. Use shoes um, would be a big help. Sneakers, um, it could use socks, bring those in as well because they will need those kinds of things. Um, use book bags, um, anything that you feel um, is gently used and people can still get some use out of it. This is a time that, you know, people aren't really being discriminatory on what they're accepting because they need it. And so um, for people who have lost everything, those things are really worth a lot to them. On Saturday, August 13, the Love Foundation will move forward with the distribution of the items collected as explained by Sewell, who says they will need persons who are skilled in electrical, plumbing and carpentry areas. Planning on setting up two stations, one at 47 Vernon Street and one at the Yabra Community Drop-In Center. And so those two stations will be manned. One, we would need people to register the volunteers because everybody who comes to volunteer, we want to be able to capture, you know, who those persons are so that we can say thank you afterwards. So we will be registering all volunteers. Anybody who drops off anything from today onward, um, we're capturing that information as well. Um, so we'll need people to help us sort. We'll need people to be able to go out and help with minor repairs on, on homes. Um, we will need people, you know, if people want to donate um, refreshments for the, the volunteers, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, and we would need people to help with that as well. We would need people to help, um, you know, help to help people with um, bagging their stuff and getting their stuff to where they need to go, um, which would be walking distance from any of these, um, these places. So um, we will not, you know, we, we will need a lot of volunteers to help. And also I want to mention that we are collecting nationwide so the department of youth services has come on board in a big way as one of our partners so um, nationwide people can drop off anything that they want to drop off to the department of youth services um, in their respective um, communities and we will ensure that it gets to belize city now this is the first of four saturdays so for the next four weeks these command posts will be in place and it, we will still be accepting donations so if you didn't get a chance to do it this week, you can do it next week, but it, it's ongoing. Within Belize City, we can coordinate pickup. I have had some people call me and ask me um, to pick up from them, but preferably we'd like to have it dropped off at the building at 47 Vernon Street. There, the security is there 24 hours. Um, the building can be open so that people can put their donations into the area that's allocated for us to receive those donations. So. Um, I would ask people to just drop off their donations. Please do not bring donations to Love FM. We cannot house the donations here. We don't have the room. You have to drop the donations off at 47 Vernon Street. Gems being donated can be taken to the Love Foundation's office at 46A Vernon Street at the three-story green cement structure on the left. 205 countries from around the world have sent athletes to the 2016 Olympic Games currently underway in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. The teams will be taking part in 306 events surrounding 42 sporting disciplines ranging from swimming to judo and wrestling. The Games began Saturday, August 6th and will continue through to August 20th. Belize has sent a delegation with three athletes 
namely Katy Seely, Brandon Jones, and Rennick James. The opening ceremony took place on Friday with a parade of the athletes' music and festivity, as well as the lighting of the Olympic cauldron. During the opening ceremony, the Belize flag was carried by Brandon Jones. 29-year-old Brandon will be taking part in the men's 200 meters and is scheduled to compete on August 16th, 17th and 18th. 25-year-old Kay Seeley will be taking part in the women's 100-meter hurdles and is slated to compete on August 16th and 17th, while 28-year-old Rennick James will compete in the judo men's competition on August 10th. The closing ceremony for the Olympic Games will take place on August 21. Belize first participated in the Olympic Games in 1968 when it was held in Mexico City. Since then, Belize has had representation at 10 other Olympic Games, but to date has not won any medals in any of the event. As hundreds of families are toiling to get their homes back to normal, a taxi driver and a Belize City resident were reportedly transporting illegal drugs to Orange Walk Town from Belize City. Police had set up a checkpoint in San Hill Village, Belize District, on Saturday when just after midnight they came across a 1995 maroon Chevy Prism taxi registered in the Orange Walk District. A search of the vehicle resulted in the discovery of a black plastic bag containing 260 grams of cannabis. Police subsequently arrested the driver, 41-year-old Julian Chuk of Belize Street in Orange Walk Town and 24-year-old Kadim Courtney of a Tabruce Street address of Belize City. Both men were charged with drug trafficking. On Friday night at about 8 o'clock, members of the gang suppression uh, unit conducted understand. operations in the area of Kelly Street in Belize City. A search was conducted on a heavily tinted vehicle that was parked. The vehicle was occupied by a key getter and two other male persons. Whilst nothing incriminating was found in the car, 24-year-old Kendis Flowers of Mayflower Street was found with just under a gram of cannabis on his person. Flowers was arrested and charged for the offense of possession of controlled drugs. Just before 1 o'clock on Saturday morning, based on intelligence gathered, the GSU did a search in a house on West Street in Lee City where they found 18 rounds of ammunition, 14 of them were 9mm hollow point, and four of them were .45 rounds. The ammunition was found concealed in a black plastic bag between the zinc ceiling and the beam. There was no one in the area at the time of the search. The ammunition was taken in and labeled as found property. At about 8 o'clock on Saturday, August 6, members of the GSU intercepted a white Toyota Tacoma pickup on Marine Parade where they found a black Glock 9mm pistol loaded with eight live rounds of ammunition. The firearm was found under the front passenger seat. Another firearm was also found in the vehicle, but it was a licensed weapon for 50-year-old Keith Byrne Drury. Since both Keith Byrne and Mark and Drury were unable to produce a license for the first firearm found, the two men were jointly arrested and charged for firearm offenses. Mark and Drury is allegedly a member of the PIV gang and was wanted for questioning in a homicide investigation. The gang suppression unit continued their operations right through to this morning where they conducted a search of a Tillits bus just before 7 o'clock this morning where they found 10 boxes of tomatoes and 3 sacks of onions which were believed to be uncustom goods. No one in the bus claimed the merchandise and as such they were handed over to the Customs and Excise Department. The bus was traveling to Orange Walk from Belize City. Our thought conditioner for today is from Winston S. Churchill. It reads, and we quote, It is not enough that we do our best. Sometimes we must do what is required. This has been the Evening News on Love Television. We invite you to log into our website at www.lovefm.com for transcripts of our news stories. Thank you for watching. I am Ernesto Vasquez.